taking credit for UN budget cut, Trump's envoy hints at more to come. At least four times in the past week, the Trump administration has linked financial support for the United Nations to compliance with American demands. First President Trump and his ambassador, Nikki R. Halley, fumed that all countries with seats on the Security Council except the United States had opposed American recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital and his decision to put the United States embassy there. Then Mr. Trump dared the General Assembly to follow the Security Council's example. Let them vote against us, he said. We will save a lot. When the General Assembly voted 128 to 9 against the Americans, Ms. Halley said she would take names and remember them the next time the United States was asked for financial help from members who disagreed with its stance on Jerusalem. The vote against the United States, she said, would make a difference on how we look at countries who disrespect us at the UN. Then on Sunday, when United Nations members reached agreement on a 2018-2019 budget of 5.4 billion, Ms. Halley issued a statement emphasizing the American role in achieving more than 285 million in cuts, along with hints of more reductions to come. We will no longer let the generosity of the American people be taken advantage of or remain unchecked, Ms. Halley said. In future negotiations, she said, you can be sure we'll continue to look at ways to increase the U.N.S. efficiency while protecting our interests. It was certainly not the first time Ms. Halley had hinted at using America's financial leverage to get its way at the United Nations. When she first took the job last January, she warned that you're going to see a change in the way we do business. And Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that some parts of the organization must become more efficient. But the link between American largesse and political sympathies at the United Nations has been a recurring theme for Mr. Trump who once described the 72-year-old organization created after World War II as a sad social club that had squandered its potential. Many among Mr. Trump's base of supporters regard the organization as suspiciously anti-American. When the 285 million budget cut was reported on Monday in Breitbart News, a media group that supports Mr. Trump, reader responses were ebullient, with some arguing that America's entire contribution should be rescinded. Critics of Mr. Trump's approach to the United Nations argue that American coercion can work against the United States, by subverting respect for the agreed-upon protocol for financial contributions. They say Mr. Trump should not expect others to follow his lead just because the United States wields the biggest monetary cudgel. The hallmark of this administration is not paying attention to the benefits that the United States actually gets in a rule-bound system with international institutions, Stuart Patrick. A senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, said after the Jerusalem vote last Thursday. This is not something we can treat in a purely transactional way. Under a formula tied to economic size and other measurements established under an article of the United Nations Charter, the United States is responsible for 22% of the United Nations operating budget, the largest contribution. It paid about 1.2 billion of the 2016 to 2017 budget of 5.4 billion. The United States also is the largest single financial contributor, at 28.5%, to a separate budget for United Nations peacekeeping operations, which totals 6.8 billion in the 2017 to 2018 budget finalized in June. Then, as now, Ms. Halley took credit for cuts to that budget which she said had exceeded 500 million. We're only getting started, she said at the time. According to the United States mission, the reductions in the budget reached on Sunday included across-the-board cuts in expenses for travel, consultants and other operating expenses. It also included tightened rules on compensation and new ways to maximize the use of United Nations headquarters in New York to reduce the need for expensive leased space. Human rights groups reached on Monday reserved a judgment on the new budget, saying they needed to see more details on how it might affect the United Nations' ability to monitor abuses or respond to emergencies major parts of its work. They also did not necessarily disagree with Ms. Halley's appraisal of the cuts. But some worried about the potential impact of future reductions. There's nothing wrong with increasing efficiency and eliminating waste at the UN, said Louis Charbonny the United Nations Director at Human Rights Watch. 
but it's crucial that we don't curtail the U.N.S ability to monitor, investigate and expose human rights abuses or its ability to save the lives of men, women and children worldwide. Thank you for watching. For the follow up, subscribe to the channel yourself here. It's Christmas. When Trump forbade a Christmas tree and other forgotten stories from the war on Christmas. It's Christmas, and President Trump is celebrating by repeatedly typing Merry Christmas. And by taking credit for having led a charge against the assault of our cherished and beautiful phrase. Ah, the proverbial war on Christmas, in which the holiday is under attack with even a Merry Christmas greeting frowned upon and the faithful fight to defend it. And first among them Trump. But is Trump really the hero here? Or was he always more of a bystander or worse? It depends on how many Christmases we look at. Christmas 1981 no trees allowed. In the 1980s, his political rise still decades away, Trump bought an old apartment building across the street from Central Park in New York that he hoped to tear down and rebuild as a high rent tower. When the longtime residents wouldn't move out voluntarily, the New York Times wrote, Trump hired a management company that essentially ran the building into the ground. And while Trump threatened to house homeless people in the building, the management company used creative tactics that included covering windows in tin and forbidding Christmas decorations in the lobby. It was probably the least of residents' concerns, but Trump allowed no Christmas tree in 1981, the Times wrote, nor in the next year. Trump vowed to end the war on Christmas. Here's how the White House is decorated this season. Christmas 1983 Nowhere to go for the holidays. After two years of what New York Magazine called a cold war between Trump's tenants and his managers, the Central Park building was a mess of hostility and broken appliances. A tenant representative finally wrote to Trump's management company in 1983, asking for permission to at least put up a Christmas tree. Many of the residents are very old and have nowhere to go, she wrote, the magazine reported. This will be their only chance to share in the holiday spirit. The company wrote back that in light of the tenants' complaints, it was quite difficult for management to feel that a relaxed holiday season spirit relationship exists at the building. Moreover, a Christmas tree might raise religious liberty concerns, it said. But the company offered to allow the tree with some conditions the company would be held blameless in any claims related to the Christmas tree, and all decorations had to comply with government regulations. Here the accounts of Christmas 1983 somewhat diverge. New York Magazine wrote that tenant leader signed the contract and the Christmas tree went up, and the holiday spirit was saved. But the Times wrote that maintenance workers misunderstood the Christmas negotiations and put up a contract less tree without permission and that Trump's manager fumed but could do nothing. Christmas 1999 The Trump Tower Millennium Holiday Tree The Trump Tower Millennium Holiday Tree as described in the Seattle Post Intelligencer and news releases was a 45-foot perforated metal, gold-coated, for baroptic lighted tree-like structure unveiled at Trump Tower a month before the turn of the century. No pictures of the Millennium Holiday Tree can be found, and some references describe it as a traditional Christmas tree, which Trump Tower is now known for. It's important to note that this was several years before the war on Christmas joined the cultural lexicon when Bill O'Reilly aired an expose in 2004 on how the generic word holiday was. Supplanting traditional Christmas language. It would be even longer before Trump demonstrated any real concern about the distinction. Christmas 2009 to 2013 as told by Trump. The Obama Christmases. While Trump continued wishing happy holidays for years, his first use of the word Christmas on Twitter appears to have been in 2011 shortly after he expressed interest in running for president. Trump suggested buying his new book as a Christmas present that December, and a few days later he complained that President Barack Obama had issued a statement for Kwanzaa sick but failed to issue one for Christmas. As the Associated Press noted, this was a false assertion. Obama had, like presidents before him, acknowledged the African Heritage Festival of Kwanzaa. But he had also wished Americans Merry Christmas as he did every year during his presidency. It is true that Obama changed the annual